Science is full of mysteries, and in astronomy, new mysteries are to be expected. Many get solved, many remain open. But sometimes in the history of astronomy, mysteries can go unsolved for so long that they fall into obscurity, even if the implications of what might be happening are profound. One such example is known as Shabilsky's star, which first came to my attention over half a decade ago. In 1961, Polish-Australian astronomer Antony Zhabilsky found a star that had a very strange spectrum that he thought was very low in iron and nickel, very common metals in the universe otherwise, but also with very high levels of strontium, holmium, yttrium, and a number of other very rare elements. Since, the iron levels of the star have been found to be low but not that low. But the presence of these strange elements in the star has only deepened, and that work from five years ago hinted at the presence of transuranic elements in the star, which actually puts it on the table as a candidate for a technosignature if those elements are indeed present. My guest and I have been trying to draw attention to the star with our YouTube channels in hopes of encouraging further work into the star. If those elements are present, then whatever is causing them does not seem to be found anywhere else in nature, and may involve cutting-edge science in either the formation of elements heavier than plutonium in a star, the island of stability concept in nuclear physics, and the potential for a detection of an alien civilization. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK project. David Kipping, welcome back to the program. It's always a pleasure to be on here. Thanks, John. David, a triumph, a triumph of sorts. Uh, JWST finally looking for exomoons. Can you tell us about that? Because I know that this has been something that, you know, was rejected, but now we get to do it. Tell us about it. Yeah, this is my uh, third year in a row of trying to persuade JWST, which is, you know, the most powerful telescope that humanity has ever built, to try and undertake an experiment to really just ask the question, are there moons out there around other planets in the uh, same kind of moons that we have in our solar system. I think that's an important thing just to highlight that we kind of do expect, you know, it's not really a question of if these moons are out there. We, there must be some moons out there, surely, given the abundance of them in the solar system. But we just want to understand their character. I think there's so much we just don't know. And when you look at the study of exoplanets, before we found the first exoplanet, we thought we had it all figured out. We thought we knew what they'd be like. And of course, it was a complete revelation and surprise, all the different worlds that we found that forced us to rip up the textbook of planet formation. And so in the same way, there's a revolution waiting for us with exomoons. And finally, three years trying, third time is lucky, I guess, JWST has finally agreed to uh, point at one of our favorite planets and see if it has exomoons. Now tell us about that exoplanet. So this is a planet called Kepler 167e, and it's actually the planet, it's kind of close to my heart. It's a planet I discovered, <laughs> so it's kind of weird. I didn't really choose it for that reason. I guess it's kind of poetic that it ended up being that planet, but it genuinely is the best planet uh, for looking for exomoons that we've ever discovered. Um, maybe not a surprise given the name of my group, the Cool Worlds Lab. So it's a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting a fairly sun-like star. Um, we know of many Jupiter-sized planets orbiting sun-like stars. What makes this one particularly special is that it's really far away from its star and it transits. And those two things are pretty unusual. So it's actually at about 2 AU from its star. 
Um, but the star is slightly smaller, a little bit cooler than the, than the sun, such so as actually a K-dwarf. And so for that reason, this planet, which is on a period over a thousand days, so about three years for it to go around its star, that's its year, means that it's far enough away that its temperature is comparable to that of Jupiter. It's around 150 Kelvin, its equilibrium temperature. So a cold Jupiter. And that's very unusual. The, the method that we use the transit method mostly to look for exoplanets is strongly biased towards planets which are close to the star and that's why we know of so many hot jupiters even though hot jupiters are actually kind of rare intrinsically we know of many of them because they're just really easy to find the odds are really in your favor and it really comes down to alignment if you have two things close to each other it's easier to kind of line them up than it is to have two things you know space your hands far apart and try to get a, a straight line is requires a more finely tuned position than having your hands very close together and it's the same thing with transits so this part's pretty unusual it's the and when we looked through the list of the 5,000 exoplanets that we knew about we did this rank ordering of you know which one would have the right properties to form an exomoon which one would then have the right sort of mass and radius that it could hold on to those moons for a long period of time billions of years and then finally we put it through a simulator of JWST's capabilities and ask what would be the signal to noise how significant would these moons be and this is the absolute best one we have so if you took the Jupiter moon system it turns out that Io and Europa are probably not detectable with JWST at least for this this particular system but Ganymede and Callisto are and so we found out through injection recovery simulations that 83% of the time we could detect Ganymede and the reason why it's not 100% why, you know, why is it just not either 0% or 100% is really down to the phase of the moon. If the moon is, is widely separated from the planet when you take your photo, that's actually better for us. It's easier to distinguish them. Whereas if they're very closely separated, it's harder for us to see them. So that's why there's that 83%. Um, and then for Callisto, it's about 50%. And then when you actually combine these two odds, it ends up being over 93% in total. So if you take the moon system of Jupiter, plonk it around this planet, which by the way is Jupiter radius, Jupiter mass to within 1%. Its mass is Jupiter-like within 1%. It's like incredibly Jupiter-like. The same temperature as Jupiter, the same kind of same major axis as Jupiter. Everything's very similar. Um, it really should have these moons and 93% of the time in our simulations, JWST will get them to high significance of over five sigma. So this is it. it, it either, either we will find the first exomoons convincingly like finally i think everybody will be satisfied that these are not exotic enough to make people stomach turns as previous exomoons have done like neptune sized things people have been like hold on that's maybe too strange to believe these would be familiar moons that we have in our solar system detected to high significance with the most stable telescope we have in the world and uh, i think it's exciting that it could birth the finally the age of exomoons now, exomoons, um, with Jupiter anyway, the upper limit is not there. In other words, Ganymede is not the biggest you can get. So if you get a really big exomoon, that should make it much easier to detect, right? Absolutely. Yeah, the bigger it is, the easier it is. It's always kind of, um, we want them to be fairly widely separated from the planet and big. Those are the two things you're looking for. Um, the, the separation thing is tricky, like Io, you can make Io a super Io and it would still probably be difficult for us to find it. Io is really, really close to its planet and so that makes it hard. But Ganymede, Callisto on the, on the outside there, they're much easier for us. Um, and of course, if you go to the moon, the moon is really far out um, because of tides. That's That would be a, a walk in the park to find something like the moon that's really widely separated. Um, so that's what we're kind of hoping for. Um, and you know, I think the remarkable thing would be Imagine if we came back and we said, uh, this planet does not have any moons. That would actually be, I think, I know it's a bit pathological to say this, but I think that would actually be the more interesting result because it would mean that what happens on Jupiter and, and Saturn, we take the exact same theories when we do this work, the exact same theories, the accepted theories of how moons form, and we simulate them using those existing models. And of course, you can produce the same kind of moons that we have in our solar system doing that. But... If that turns out that this planet does not have those moons, then it means there's something special about the solar system, that that process is not universal. And that would be kind of the most profound thing because we currently have no way to build a giant planet in a computer simulation 
that does not form those moons. There is no model of planet formation of giant planets that does not end up with these moons around them. So it would cause us to really have to think hard about, you know, we, we're missing something. So, I, you know, it maybe is a bit of a, uh, a strange thing to hope for, I, but it actually might be more interesting if we didn't find anything. Um, I strongly suspect we will find something, of course, but uh, it would. I think the nice thing with this experiment is that either way, there's something pretty interesting on either end of it. That's absolutely amazing, and I love it that the null result is actually the weirder one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that kind of science. Uh, now, when you're looking with JWST, you're gonna. I, I assume you're gonna have to look for a long time. You're gonna have a lot. Have to have a lot of observation time to catch the you know this the sex element. So, what's that profile look like? How long do you have to stare at it with uh, Webb? Yeah, we asked for almost sixty hours of telescope time, which is an enormous ask. And to be honest with you, that was why I was kind of worried that we would not be granted the telescope time. And the reason why we need so much is for two reasons. One, this planet, as I said earlier, is far away from its star. So that means it's moving very slowly. If you think about planetary orbits, the further away they are, the slower their speed. So it takes this planet just a long time to transit its star. It's about 20 hours, I think, off the top of my head. So 20 hours just to cause the eclipse itself. And then you want some extra time either side to actually cover the region where the moons might live. So altogether, that's about 60 hours. And then on top of that, there's some overhead time that JWST engineers insist that you have that ends up pushing this up to 70 hours. So that's almost three days, right? So three continuous days of just looking at a single object and taking what will amass to probably hundreds of thousands of images. We take an image, I think, every um, every 1.5 seconds or something of this object. So there's going to be a lot of images of the same thing. And um, that's a huge ask. And for comparison, if you want to, say, measure the atmosphere of a hot Jupiter, which is what JWST has been doing a lot of that kind of work so far, um, or look at the TRAPPIST-1 system where the planets are much closer in, the ask is far less. You're looking at maybe five hours, six hours of telescope time. So that means that to ask for 70 hours, your telescope proposal has to be basically like 10 times better than those other proposals. And that's hard because my colleagues are very good at writing compelling science cases. So I'm kind of amazed and extremely grateful that the community has agreed that this is worth the risk and worth the investment to try. And um Besides from the moons, there's some other cool stuff uh, we can also do in, with this single observation as well. So happy to talk about that. But I think the, just the fact that they're going after the moons, uh, they're agreeing with us is amazing. You know, I've talked to people that are at the, the you know, involved with uh, running web. And they did seem rather dynamic and interested in, in, in looking at, you know, things that might be a little bit more difficult, you know, I wouldn't say a long shot. And one of the things that they recently did was they looked at Tabby Star. <laughs> and we haven't seen the we haven't seen the results yet, but but they they did seem to be really dynamic about things. And I'm glad that Exomoons are on the table. But here's my question for you, and this may sound pedantic. What are we going to designate those things? So say you find one around Kepler, whatever B or C or whatever, <laughs> what do you call an exomoon? Yeah. I'm kind of like in the camp of I don't care that much, but, but I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what the the official answer, I guess. We've in the past, my my previous student Alex Teacher, who's now a postdoc in Taipei, uh, looking for exomoons over there. He he felt much more strongly about this, and he thought that the appropriate naming system was a Roman numeral after the planet name, because actually that's how the Jupiter moons are already named. So actually, Io is technically Jupiter Roman numeral I. And then uh, Europa is II, so you kind of follow that scheme. Um, and it's capitalized, it's capitalized Roman numerals. So for our previous exomoon candidates, we called them uh, lowercase i, because our intent there was to say these are exomoon candidates, not confirmed. And so we'll use lowercase rather than uppercase. And we're trying to follow that naming system. But um, yeah, I think, uh, the, honestly, I'll let the IOU figure that out. I, I don't really have a strong opinion about it. And the whole thing with naming, it's to, it's such a human compulsion to come up with a system to to classify things. But you know, there's things like Pluto, which defy simple classification. And there's things like brown dwarfs, similarly, that we still can't really agree. Like, is a brown dwarf a, a failed star? 
a star type object or is it like a supersized planet like we no one really knows what to do with that and that's relevant because if you found a companion something orbiting a brown dwarf what is that is that a moon or is that a planet and and then it really does become an issue in terms of you know how you write your press release i suppose but nature doesn't care nature doesn't care what we call it and so it's uh that's the way i tend to think about it. like a rose by any of the name still smells as sweet and so um i i tend to focus on the science and let the <laughs> let everyone else argue about the names maybe i'll do like a youtube poll or something and let those guys decide excellent when i make a video on the discovery i'll i, I get to use words such as exo ganymede or <laughs> anti callisto <laughs> Love it. yeah now, what do you look for, though, when you're looking at through the data, the JWST data? Are you looking for another transit? I mean, what does an exomoon look like in that data? There's a few different things we can look for. Uh, usually, one of the effects we look for is a wobble, wobble of the planet. So we can see if the planet moves a little bit earlier or later than we'd normally expect it to transit. Now, in this case, we're probably not going to be able to look for that. The reason is because the JWST data is so much more precise than anything we've previously had, which is to say the Kepler data, it's going to be like of order of 10 times more precise that it's essentially like the first type of measurement of its class. So you can't look for a wobble with one measurement. And the previous data is just so noisy that you know you wouldn't be able to see these tiny wobbles caused by these little moons. So we're not going to be able to look for the wobble, which is unfortunate, because that'd be nice, because it would actually tell us how heavy the moons were. But if JWST looks at it again in another three years after this, in 2027, then we could potentially get that wobble in the future. So instead, all we can really look for are the dips caused by the exomoon, the, the effect of the moon blocking out starlight. So if the moon's widely separated, we expect to get a second dip or even set of dips for multiple moons and that's certainly something we're going to be looking for to see if there's a whole system of those moons um, and that could either come before or after the primary planetary transit and then on on top of that there is a slightly other weird effect that can happen it's kind of relevant for people who are maybe thinking about seeing the total solar eclipse uh, in April or in future total solar eclipses um, which is called a syzygy. So a syzygy is when all three objects line up. It's what happens during a lunar eclipse and a total solar eclipse or any kind of solar eclipse. And during that, all three objects line up. And so what happens is the moon comes into transit as the planet comes into transit. And so it's, but it's just before or just after. And so the total amount of light that's blocked out is the sum of their two sizes, essentially. But then the moon passes either in front or behind of the planet during the transit overall. So as the whole the whole system is passing in front of the star, the moon sneaks behind the planet or sneaks in front of the planet. And so when that happens, no longer are you blocking out planet plus moon, you're now only blocking out planet. And so actually you get a weird effect where the, where the brightness of the star increases for a short amount of time. And that's actually a essentially a total solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse that you're observing on another planet. So uh, we can actually detect those and uh, that would be slightly harder for us to detect for, as I mentioned earlier, but it is in principle possible if the moon is big enough that we could see those as well. So we'll be looking for all of those effects in this data set. Two questions. First of all, will you be viewing the solar eclipse next month? I will because my state is blessed with having been in totality in 2017 and is again. Wow, uh, next very month. Lucky. So, yeah, so I don't have to. I don't have to travel far. But the other thing is that what do you think you can tease out of the data that you expect to get? Say you catch the exomoon, you know, an existence of an exomoon around this this exoplanet. What do you think you can infer about that exomoon based on that data set? Yeah. So obviously, yeah, I'm excited for the eclipse. I'll be down in Texas viewing it um, near Dallas. So um, I'm giving a lecture down there, a private lecture, and then I'm going to uh, head out with my family and check it out. So pumped about that. It's not happening for another 20 years in the US, so I'm I'm not going to miss this one. Uh, and then for the exomoon question, so what can we measure? We get the size of the moon. Um, we'll get how far away the moon is from its planet. But there's another like really cool effect that we can measure that I wanted to mention, and that's we can measure the ablateness of the planet. So if the, we normally assume that planets are spherical, but of course they're not. They're always slightly ablate. They tend to bulge out at their equator a little bit more than their poles. Saturn is the most uh, famous example of this. It actually is 10% wider 
at its at its equator than it is at its poles. And so that causes an asymmetry in the light curve potentially. And we can look for that. So it turns out this effect has never been seen before in any observations, but it has been predicted for about 20 years already. And for this particular planet, it's also not just a perfect planet for exomoons, but a perfect planet for seeing this signal. The reason being that it's not so close to its star that it would have tidally locked. Most of the exoplanets JWC is looking at are really close to the star, and thus, like the moon has tidally locked to the Earth, they would have tidally locked to their, to their host star. What tidal locking really means is that you're spinning slowly, that your spin rate, your day, equals your year, which means a, a slow spin rate, really. Whereas Jupiter spins every 10 hours, so that's a fast spin rate. And that fast spin rate, and similarly for Saturn's a similar kind of period, those fast spin rates cause them to bulge out. So we really expect this planet is far enough from its star that it should still have what we would call its primordial spin. The spin that it was actually born with when the when the planet was first formed it would have lost a little bit over time but most of its angular momentum should still be there that causes this bulging effect we can look for that not only can we measure how uh, ablate the planet is but we could also measure its obliquity so if it's tilted over so this is where it gets really fun so we can measure the tilt is it like you know the earth's tilt is 23 degrees that's what gives us our seasons and so uh, we might expect the, the the tilt here to be giving us some clues to the dynamical history of this exoplanet. And then we can measure also the orbital plane of the moons and see how does that compare to the spin axis of the planet. So this is where it gets really fun. So if you think about um, Uranus, for example, uh, Uranus is tilted over on its side. So its obliquity has been knocked right over. So that's a very highly ob oblique system. And interestingly, the moons went along for the ride. They're, they're in the same plane as the spin axis. So that kind of tells us that therefore the moons must have formed through a, uh, through a disk type situation. Like the whole disk was dragged along with that, with that whatever knocked it over on its side. And then the moons formed from that disk. So we can actually learn how the moons formed. Whereas with Neptune, vice versa, Neptune has fairly sl uh, small obliquity, but its moon Triton is completely on its on, been twisted over so that has a almost a retrograde orbit. it is retrograde a little bit more than retrograde and so that that angle is humongous between the spin axis and the orbital plane and so that tells us that that must have been a captured moon so by measuring this obliquity angle with respect to the moons that we expect to find we'll probably be able to tell how the moon's actually formed in this system as well so this is this is pretty amazing like there's actually and this is going to be a gem of a system. It's going to teach us things that were previously kind of unthinkable for exoplanets. Yeah, this is the good stuff. Um, when you start talking about thing, being able to determine if you're looking at a at a you know gas giant or something like that that's rotating normally, like you like you would expect from its formation, versus Uranus. What happened to Uranus to knock it on its side? And I've always found that to be sort of spooky in a way because it, something happened there. <laughs> you yeah. know, something happened to that planet. And it mm, doesn't seem like that's going to happen a lot. <laughs> you know, gigantic impact or I don't know, is, is, is something like instability on the table there where you don't need an impact? I don't even know. But yeah, it's very weird, and I'm I'm astonished that you can tell that, or you, or you have the prospect of telling that about this uh, this gas giant. Yeah, and it's actually quite easy for us to see remarkably. So I think we did, we calculated in the proposal that even if it has the same, I mean, remember this planet, as I said, is within one percent the mass of Jupiter and within ten percent the radius of Jupiter. So it's almost a Jupiter twin. And if you take Jupiter's ablateness, this would be a 13 sigma detection. Now, that is huge. Like the Higgs boson, when it was first announced, was five sigma. So this would be, you know, two and a half times more significant than the Higgs boson detection, just assuming it had Jupiter-like ablateness. So it's, it's actually a pretty trivial observation. And again, it would be kind of amazing if we didn't detect that signal, because our upper limits will imply if it doesn't have that signal, it must have somehow lost all of its spin, which is very weird. It's just so far away from its star that there's basically no understood mechanism for that to happen. So we really expect to see that. And I kind of love the fact with both cases that we really expect to see these signals, but it's the first time we've ever done this experiment, really. And so who knows? And if we don't detect those signals, 
it would be perhaps even more interesting. So uh, very exciting times. And I think this system, it, it's, it's one of the very best ones. We had a couple of other objects that were comparable, but not quite as good as this one. And so, you know, maybe in next year, we'll hopefully get time on those as well. Um, and I think there'll be of order of about six or seven planets like this, where we can do this kind of experiment, and but where we can both detect the moons and the flattening, the ablateness as we call it, and really get a, a very rich and detailed picture of how satellites form elsewhere in the universe. Now, just for the listeners, you know, 13 Sigma is huge, you know, in within within astronomy, three Sigma is compelling, <laughs> you know, that's where you're starting to get into, you know, really solid territory. And I think it's higher for the particle physicists, like five or whatever, but 13, that's big. Now, what can you perhaps tease out about the moon? And let's just spin a speculative yarn here. Say you see a big one, you know, a, a a habitable exomoon is there any way to tell that so say you see one big enough to have an atmosphere hold on to an atmosphere um actually let's say it's an earth size <laughs> exomoon yeah. um is there anything that you can hope to tease out this early with jwst that might give you some characterization of of an atmosphere of an exomoon or is that for future telescopes yeah, I think that would be very hard. Um, it is in principle possible. And I've, you know, myself and another colleague, Lisa Kausenegger, have written papers about that in the past, showing that you can use essentially the same technique that we use to measure planetary atmospheres that GWST is having a lot of fun with right now. You can use that same technique to measure moon atmospheres. But the big problem with measuring an atmosphere is you want two things. You want a large... Uh, atmosphere essentially and uh, that requires uh, and a bright star um, and but a large atmosphere itself comes with certain requirements you want the the planet or the moon itself to be big which obviously is, if it's earth size is that might seem big compared to Ganymede but it's still extremely small compared to the things that we typically use this technique on with current technology so it'll be really difficult um, Plus, this planet is very cold. So remember I told you its equilibrium temperature is 150 Kelvin. Now, the problem with that is that um, the size of an atmosphere depends on its temperature. Just think about like a hot air balloon. Like if you, if you add energy, it puffs up. And so the more it puffs up, the hotter it is, the easier it is for us to make that detection. This thing's so cold, the atmosphere almost like kind of freezes down. It collapses down to a very, very thin atmosphere and so it's going to be extremely difficult for us to in practice make a measurement um now maybe the moon could be tidally heated that could be adding some extra heat or something to puff up an atmosphere so i wouldn't totally rule it out but um we found that even for this planet let alone the moon detecting the atmosphere would be a challenge it's doable but even for the jupiter-sized planet um, we only expected to get sort of of order of sort of four to five sigma significance of the of the of the gas giant's atmosphere. So again, that's sort of like the level that you would believe more than three sigma, but not at the level where you think I have lots of play here and I can divide this by a factor of a hundred and still be okay. And that really would be the kind of scaling you'd be looking at. So now I think I think for detecting a moon's atmosphere, this unfortunately would not be your best target. Um, and you would want something that was probably like the, our previous exomoon candidates, those Neptunian-like moons, they would be far more amenable to that type of measurement. Now, uh, funny enough, I actually have uh, sitting right here on the desk is Dr. Colton Eggers' uh, upcoming book that I'm reading an advanced copy of. So you, you can probably guess who I'm interviewing soon. Um, yeah, I just interviewed her myself and read the book, yeah. She's, she'll be on the podcast, uh, the Cool Words podcast, when the book drops. So look out for that, yeah. Yes, tell everybody about the Cool Worlds podcast, because that's actually separate from the channel, right? Yeah, it's a little kind of hobby side project for me. And um, I, you know, I do the YouTube channel and that's fun, but it's all scripted. I, you know, if, which is great because you do a lot of research. You can make sure that everything you say is uh, correct and accurate and do a lot of fact checking to make sure it's up to high standard. But at the same time, it loses that kind of conversational nature, which is, of course, what we're doing right now. And that, that's why I was love podcasts i listen to old podcasts myself and yeah i kind of felt like there was a space missing at least in in my own sort of domain of just having long-form conversations with my colleagues both from a selfish perspective of just getting to sit down with them and 
talk to them and learn more about their research. And also just often on long drives, um, which I often do over the weekends, um, I, I miss having... Uh, enough material. So yours, your podcast is right up there as one of the things I was listening to. I listened to Fraser Kane's podcast. And then I tend to kind of run dry after that of like astronomy podcast. So I was like, we need more astronomy podcasts. And so, uh, I, yeah, I, I've started it recently. And I have to say, I haven't done enough episodes. I think there's only 10 episodes to date. It's only been like roughly once a month or so. We've posted one. But I'm just sort of banking in now. I've got a whole bunch of great guests lined up. Um, to to try and pick up the slack. I'll be interviewing one tomorrow, actually. Um, and as I said, Lisa's, uh, Lisa's will be coming out pretty soon. So yeah, we'd go for about an hour. Uh, check it out. It's on, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes, whatever you want. Um, but also it's on YouTube and the handle is at Cool Worlds Podcast. And I do enjoy that one as well as Fraser's. Um, but one of the big problems I have with, with astronomy podcasts is that when you get down from there, they get really, really basic. And I, I always thought, hey, I'm talking to astronomy and science enthusiasts. So why not go deeper and, you know, deep dive into this stuff? And there isn't enough of that. I agree with you 100 percent. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this, <laughs> you know, yeah, get yeah. a little bit higher quality and a little bit deeper than, you know, very, very basic science. Um, and there's a place for that, of course. But, yeah. you know, there's also a place for more in depth. Now. The next thing I want to ask you about is in relation to a recent Cool Worlds video. And this is one of the things in the universe that puzzles me very deeply, above and beyond Tabby Star or any of the weird, you know, wow signal or anything like that. If the measurements are correct, we're looking at a very weird star, Shabilsky's star. And this star has been known to be weird since Anthony Jabilski, the Polish-Australian astronomer, first did work on it in the 1960s. Um, and he noticed a, you know, a very, very low uh, proportion of iron in this star, which turned out to not really be the case. But Russian researchers a number of years ago looked at it and they saw transuranic elements in it. Now, I want to sort of preface this with... Um, Carl Sagan and Shlovsky back in the 1960s wrote a book. I think it's Life in the Universe or something like that. Hmm. Where they posit that if you see plutonium in a star, you're looking at a likely technosignature. Now, plutonium we have to sort of leave off because it actually can occur in nature. And they didn't know that, but it can, but only in tiny quantities. Yeah. So these researchers look at this thing and they see these spectra of transuranic elements you know, just upper order elements that should not be there. Do you think we're looking at a measurement problem, you know, an error there, or do we need to take a deeper look at the star and see what, what exactly is going on here and start asking questions about what could create those elements? And further, it starts questions like the the, the island of stability start coming in. What's your view on this? I know you recently did a really good video on it. Yeah, it's it's a very intriguing star. It's one of those stars that I'm kind of surprised more people aren't talking about and, and knowing about. So I wanted to highlight it, and I know that you've highlighted it on your channel in the past as well, like two or three years ago. I think you did a video about it. So there's there's like it's kind of at that Reddit level, I like to think, where like the real nerds kind of know about it, but it, for some reason it hasn't penetrated into the mainstream. But uh, it's a fascinating object. So there's several things which are odd about it. I mean, there's there's all these trans uh, uranium elements that you mentioned the actinides and you know some of that stuff like actinium really just shouldn't be there that has a half-life of 22 years so the stars are you know, over a billion years old what the hell is that stuff doing in that star atmosphere it doesn't make any sense something must be manufacturing these elements um and that's where sagan's idea comes in that somebody could be dumping it you know maybe it's either radioactive waste or a deliberate signal that they 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 know that this will be obviously strange and that then another civilization like our own will be able to detect that and identify that hey that's a that's an intelligent civilization over there um 
It isn't actually absurd amounts. I, I did the calculation after somebody asked in the YouTube comments section. I love the YouTube comments for this. There's a lot of bad comments in YouTube, but there's also some great comments. And one of them was like, how much, um, how much of this stuff would be necessary? And I did the calculation. It's about the mass of Vesta, I think. In fact, I think it's like a tenth of the mass of Vesta per year that you have to dump into the star. So, you know, Vesta's a large asteroid, but that's the that seems not too crazy that you could imagine um, being able to, but it's not like a, a Jupiter mass or something that you have to throw into the star. So the actual abundances are very small, but they're still way, way above what you would naturally expect. Um, of course, besides the trans uranium elements, there's also all these lanthanides which are in there, which are not um, unstable in the same sense, but they're far more abundant than we would expect. So this is stuff like lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, stuff like this. And again, all that really is very odd. None of that has really been seen in the star, this kind of abundance before. I think there it's of order of a thousand times more than what the sun has. Um, and so you have another kind of mystery, even ignoring the radioactive elements, just why does it have so many strange elements? I think the lanthanides are actually a good um, starting point for the conversation because there we perhaps believe it more. So you might believe there's measurement error for reasons we can get into for the radioactive elements. But for the lanthanides, um, we actually have a better handle uh, as spectrally what those elements should be doing. Um, whereas for the actinides, these, these very heavy elements like plutonium, we really don't know what the spectrum of those is because to measure the spectrum of something observationally, you basically have to ground up into a powder or a gas form, you stick it into a, a kiln, you heat it up to the temperature of a star, basically here like 7,000 Kelvin or something, and then you try and pass light through it and you see what the spectrum is. And surprisingly, we've not, uh, not surprisingly, we've not done that for, for these elements because they're incredibly rare. I think like Berkelium, one of these elements that's in the star, we've only ever made something like a gram of it in the entire history of humanity. So it's not surprising that that was not one of the high priority things to do with Berkelium before it decayed in the sort of uh, decades that you have to work with it. So um, it is possible that the lines that we see have been misidentified and we think this is Neptunium, we think this is you know, Curium, Berkelium, all this weird stuff. But in fact, uh, it's a different element that we've just misidentified. Um, having said that, in the paper that it was actually uh, Vera Gopka that discovered, you, know, you mentioned these Ukrainian scientists that discovered these, um, these elements in the star, they uh, actually did a calculation where they tried to theoretically predict where these lines should be. And then they compared that, I think for one or two of these elements, there was actually some observational constraints uh, from laboratory measurements and they actually lined up. So they kind of used that to support their claims. So they said, look, you know, many of these were kind of sort of using theory to guess where these lines should be. But in the couple of cases where it does overlap, the overlap actually matches what we'd expect from, from laboratory measurements. So it's, it's not that easy to dismiss the argument that they just screwed up or somebody screwed up down the line. It's it's hard to understand how you could get this very rich forest of spectral lines of which for some reason, if it's not any of these trans uranium elements, then what is it? It has to be something else then. And if it's presumably something lighter than those elements, how come we don't have a, how, I mean, most of the elements below that, we have a pretty good handle as to what the spectral behavior would be. So. It doesn't really resolve it just to say that they screwed up. It, it, there's still a mystery there. Are you aware? So the Ukrainian scientists, I, I said Russian mis, misspoke because that's that's what had always been uh, said about the star, those observations. But Ukrainian scientists, of course, um, are they still looking at it? Is there anybody on the globe looking at Chapulsky's star to confirm or attempt to confirm or disprove the detection of those spectra? I'm not aware of anyone doing it. You know, when I made that video, um, I the first thing I said, I had uh, beers one of my colleagues, Rebecca Oppenheimer, who works at the Museum of Natural History, and uh, she has a, a telescope that, uh, or an instrument that she put on a telescope called Parvi, 
which would be perfect for this because really you want a very high resolution spectrograph because the resolution of the spectrograph they used was about 80,000 on this eight meter class telescope that ESO have. So uh, there's not many telescopes which are that big and that high resolution, but actually Parvi could have done it. And so we were having beers. I was like, we should, we should do it. Why don't we, let's go after it. You know, this YouTube video has inspired me uh, to try and observe this thing. She was like, yeah, there's one problem. It's in the South. And <laughs> you can't, we can't observe that. So this is like my theory. You know, I'm kind of like the theorist who like doesn't think about the, ob the observations and, you know, suddenly realized that it wasn't accessible from where we are. So, uh, I would love somebody to do it. It's not accessible with any of the stuff I have access to. But um, as far as I'm aware, the answer, the short answer is no. And I, I don't understand why that hasn't happened. And I hope that us talking about it and my video and your podcasts actually inspire an astronomer out there to spend an hour of, of their precious telescope time, I appreciate, but to spend an hour just seeing, do you at least see the same uh, spectral features? That's the first question. And then if you do see the same spectral features, the next question is, okay, we believe them, but what are those lines? Are they, is there any alternative to it than, than these uh, radioactive elements? Could it be something else? Um, and that would probably require some theorists. But I think the simplest thing to go after is just to observationally confirm that they're real. All right, Australians and Chile. We have some magnificent telescopes in Chile. So researchers working in Australia or Chile or New Zealand and anything else, take a look, please, because this star is it needs to be put to bed <laughs> if, it, yeah. if it either has this stuff or it doesn't. But the payoff of it actually having it, you know, and leaving alien techno signatures aside just the idea that this can happen to a star is weird you know almost you, you have to start asking questions about like bombardment from a neutron star but that doesn't work you know what mm. what could cause the nuclear hanky panky that we're we seem to be seeing and also convectivity because you know is is the star somehow concentrating these elements from deep below into its upper atmosphere which, where it's visible is there a mechanism for that? You know, I mean, what what can a, a peculiar star like this do? And why don't we see this level anyway of weirdness with other peculiar stars? Now, we do see some of it, you know, in fairness, there there are other stars in the peculiar star territory that do some weird chemical stuff, elemental stuff, but not to this level. And why is it just this one star? Are there others? And those are the mm. things that need to be looked at, right, David? Yeah, I mean, when I we had a pro we did a video before this one on um, green stars. Why are there no green stars? Which is a similar kind of idea because it's thinking about spectroscopy, really, which is looking at the colors of light that come off a star. And uh, it's kind of a fun video, but you can just kind of show that it's impossible to ever have a star that to human eyes would be considered green. Um, and really that's because the sun really kind of should be green already. It actually does peak at green wavelengths, but you can't compress the spectral function down such that there's no blue and red light. And because you have the blue and the red light, then it appears white overall to us. Um, modulo the, the, the Rayleigh scattering the atmosphere, which makes it appear yellow. But if you're out in space, it would appear white. So... Uh, we did this video that there's no green stars and it kind of inspired me a little bit and we started a little project over it last summer to think about how would you look for stars which are just anomalous in terms of their spectrum in, in any way. You know, in, Here's an example that has these strange elements, but maybe just at the, uh, the broadband colors are off. So maybe you have a certain combination of colors and many telescopes, you think about Vera Rubin coming online soon, the LSST telescope, um, that will observe stars, I think, in six colors altogether. There's six kind of standard bands. And so it's interesting to ask, for the billions of stars that it will observe and catalog, um, are there combinations of colors that should just never happen? That no matter how many sort of, if it's a binary or trinary system, no matter what you do, no matter how many stars you add together and add white dwarfs or whatever you want into the mix, there's just no way that you could ever get this combination of colors. And then design a program that would identify those stars. And 
you know, maybe it's, you could think it's aliens, it's possible it's aliens, but I think in general, it's just anomaly detection. And that's usually where astrophysics advances is finding stuff which breaks our models. <laughs> There's like, just shouldn't be there. And it's interesting, you can reach for aliens and obviously for Pilspirsky's star, people sort of have, uh, not in a formal, I think there's a formal article that suggests aliens, but they it's often in, discussed as a possibility due to Sagan's preemptive uh, thinking along those lines. But um, it could also just be something uh, that defies our current understanding of nature. And I think this is always, it's an interesting test case. It's always a problem. What do you, uh, if aliens are a way of uh, just breaking physics, that can't, that's not enough, is it? It feels insufficient it's a god of the gaps type situation like you come across something you don't understand and you say oh that must be aliens um and then you look back in 10 years and kind of laugh at yourself and say oh actually how embarrassing that was that we just didn't know what a pulsar was whereas you know is the first pulsar was actually kind of playfully called little green man for for a while because it kind of did resemble a radio signature of maybe what an advanced alien civilization might send our way and so I think there is sort of a, a deeper problem here um, that speaks to if we are going to design an alien hunting campaign whose modus operandi is to look for that which defies physics, then surely that's almost flawed from the outset because we have to admit that we don't know all physics yet. <laughs> and so anything we find is probably you know, going to be some, some new physics that we've not found. That's interesting. But it kind of undermines the the technique as a way of finding aliens. And I think there are some. Uh, Abby's, Abby Loeb's written about this. You know, he said, I adopt the Sherlock Holmes approach to science. I kind of look at what's possible. I rule out all the possibilities. And no matter what's, whatever is left, no matter how unlikely, must be the remaining possibility, which it, I think he implies in some cases must be aliens. But um, there's, a, there's a basic problem there if you don't know what you don't know. And and that that's what kind of worries me a little bit with Pierspulski's star and with these the you know the program I just mentioned about looking for other weird stars that we need to think really hard about how we look for aliens because um, of this fundamental ambiguity given our own limited knowledge. There was a lot to unpack there. Now, first uh, about the green stars, and our sun obviously is 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 emitting green light very strongly. But the weird thing about that astrobiologically is that. The plants don't use it here. <laughs> they use red yeah. and blue light, but they the most strongest energy in, in the visible spectrum anyway, coming off the sun, they don't use. They reflect it, which is why they're green. Uh, <laughs> how's that happen? You know, why wouldn't life, you know, make use of the greatest energy source that's available to it? Any ideas? Yeah, I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I I, um, I don't think it's generally true, though. I think that I'm certainly aware of astrobiology work in my field that has touched on this in a little bit of an oblate way. And they've asked, you know, is this universally true? And the answer is probably not. That you probably can imagine around an M-dwarf, for example, where the color spectrum is completely different, that the plants would evolve to be maybe black or something instead. And that would be that they would actually absorbing all of the light from the star. So they're using... The, the red, the blue, but also the green. Otherwise, they wouldn't be black. So um, I, d I think the idea that uh, plants necessarily always have to be, and that's actually true already on, on Earth, right? There's actually um, examples of uh, leaves which are very dark colored, like red colors and even close to black colors as well. So I don't think it's universally true that that has to be so. Um, but for why it is that most life or most uh, photosynthetic life on earth has converged on not using the green light i'm not sure of the answer but i suspect there are probably listeners out there who know more about this than i do so i'm not going to try and embarrass myself by, <laughs> by speculating as to why that might be except to say that i don't believe it's a universally true thing yeah and i have to throw in a caveat there's the the purple earth <laughs> early on the purple earth uh, hypothesis and that you know different colors of plants you know and red dwarfs with black foliage that has yeah. been advanced too so there's all kinds of weird stuff there now back to Jabilsky's star okay if in this again it is highly speculative but hello science fiction author what message could you send by salting your star to other people now you could as as was you know mentioned earlier 
you could say, hey, we're here. But you could also interpret that as we have very advanced nuclear physics. Stay away from us. And it's a warning. <laughs> what, what, yeah. Have you thought about those kinds of scenarios? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, um, it implies there's accretion onto the object. And the only other example that, that that's close to this that comes to mind is white dwarf pollution. So we know of many white dwarfs that have not... Um, not these kind of radioactive elements being poured into them, but uh, rocky elements, so like silicates, oxygen, carbon, things like this, that are, that are falling onto the surface of the star. And for white dwarfs, they have a very short settling time. So if you dump something onto the surface of the star, the surface gravity is so high, and there's very little convective currents, that stuff just basically sinks to the bottom very quickly within like a few thousand years. So if you see anything on the surface, that's not helium or hydrogen, pretty much, then you know that that's something that arrived there recently and was essentially what we call accreted, dumped onto the surface of the star. So we think in that case, it's probably um, like an asteroid or something that's breaking up or even a minor planet that's got too close to the star and then tidal forces will just rip it apart and then all that dust and debris is just slowly settling onto the surface and thus providing a continuous supply for millions of years potentially. And so uh, you might imagine, you know, to me that's the closest thing I can think of that might make sense, um, but it still requires something exotic because now you have an asteroid that has been heavily enriched in these uh, unstable elements and so it and, and again, that, that object must itself be sort of continuously producing them. And that's why people have been talking about sort of islands of stability. So maybe there's something like uh, 298 fluorovium, which is a hypothesized element. We've never been able to synthesize just yet. But if we could synthesize it, it's been speculated that it could be stable for millions or even billions of years. And that would decay down into these uh, more familiar things like plutonium and uranium. Um, and so it's possible there is some exotic element out there, but then it raises the question, it really can't be natural because why why would that be there and not on Earth or anywhere else in the solar system? Uh, you know, even the rarest stuff that's made like in neutron star collisions, which produces gold, we have gold on Earth and that gold was forged from the most violent things you can think of, of two neutron stars smashing together. So... If there is a process which forms um, something like fluorovium, uh, the island of stability elements, you then kind of have to ask, like, why did it only happen here? And obviously a, a possible notion might then be, it's kind of the god of the gaps again, but to say, well, someone made it because that stuff just doesn't exist in nature as far as we can tell. Um, and it's, you know, I, I'd love to be able to survey more stars like Pushbulski star We've obviously got great data on that one star, but there are many other stars of a similar type. It's called an AP type star. And uh, it would be interesting to survey, you know, thousands of these things with spectrographs and really get a deep understanding, a deep handle as just how special is Pishpursky star amongst this already unusual class of stars. And if it really is the only example with this, I think it would add a lot of credence to the idea of something artificial going on. Without that statistic, it's a little bit hard to get a handle as to whether there is just some exotic natural process, which we're not familiar with, that could be perhaps producing this. Yeah, and my sense of Shabilsky stars that there are certain um, elements in there that are hard to get to, you know, like technetium. Not impossible, yeah. but it, it's hard to get to. And praseodymium and some of them, some of them are just, hmm, you know, um, what what sort of thing is going on there? But the but my sense is that the detections of of those, which are, you know, obviously far below the, the, uh, transuranics that also supports it. Right. And I mean, did you come across that when you were, were, you know, uh, writing your script for the video, did you come across that in your research that the detection of those elements like technetium was actually more solid than the transuranics? Yeah, I think so. I think that's much more widely accepted. Um, and there's multiple papers which have attempted to interpret that observation, in fact. And I've actually come up with some pretty good ideas that involve essentially like a levitation effect that's going on inside the star. So it's thought that um, 
an AP star, this is an AP star. And what that really means is an A-type star, which is just to say a star which is more massive than the sun. It was born with more mass than the sun. So it's A-type. Um, but normally A-type stars have uh, pretty um, weak magnetic fields. And because they have weak magnetic fields, which is as in turn as a consequence of the fact they're so big, their outer envelope is fully radiative. So it just doesn't form convective layers like the sun. And it's that convection that's thought to drive mag mag magnetism inside stars. So because it doesn't have magnetic fields, it's the magnetic fields which let stars spin down and slow down and break over time. So normally most A stars are spinning pretty fast because they don't have this magnetic breaking effect. Whereas AP stars are by definition unusual, it actually stands for peculiar, A peculiar type stars, because they um, somehow did get magnetic fields and those magnetic fields allowed the star to break. And it's thought that maybe this, ma this magnetism could explain this levitation effect, that the magnetism could be kind of grabbing on to some of these heavy elements and preferentially almost like a centrifuge lifting them up and um, fractionating the, the, the elements out into the, into the upper layer of the envelope. Um, there's some pretty detailed and complicated models which go through this, but they look fairly convincing and there's multiple papers now which have investigated that so i think the theorists at least uh have taken it as kind of accepted that these lanthanides exist in pushpursky star um weirdly enough for the actinides i don't think there's actually hardly any follow-up of this at all which is kind of weird like doesn't seem like anybody has really pursued gopka's paper and I don't understand why. I, I've spoken to the astronomers. Jason Wright has written a very nice long blog article about this, and he similarly seems a bit confused about this because nobody seems to know of anything that's wrong with the paper. Um, it's peer-reviewed. It's been accepted for publication, and it's, it's been out there for more than 10 years. So it's kind of odd that people just ignore it. And uh, I think that's why you know it's great to talk about it because maybe somebody... Maybe somebody has like an idea and they're like, oh, it's obvious. This is why it is. And I can't even bother to write about it. But I think we need to know. So I would really hope if somebody does have an explanation for what's going on here, that they would tell us about it. Because as far as I'm aware, it's it's just the paper trail kind of ends with Gopka's paper discovering these actinide elements. You know, David, I've noticed two things about that. First of all, is that this, this is fertile science territory I mean, somebody should be looking into this deeper and confirming the the original findings and you know continuing on with work because this really could yield some amazing science some very new cutting-edge stuff but i have mentioned this star to multiple guests most of them haven't heard of it it just doesn't have the press it doesn't have the attention that it really should and i don't know how it slipped under the radar any ideas on that i mean it's possible because it came from uh from the east of course you know from uh from ukraine maybe and the the authors are maybe not as well known in the western hemisphere so perhaps it's just the fact that you know western media outlets are the ones that we tend to listen to and hear from and they tend to cover articles which have you know large universities that can produce press releases and the authors can speak english and turn up on podcasts and eloquently describe their research so i suspect there's some media bias just in terms of the country of origin but um beyond that i i don't yeah i don't understand why the fact the, art, the article is written in english so some you know the english speaking scientist world could certainly pick it up and be aware of it and it's a, it does sometimes pop up in SETI conferences, but I've been to a few SETI conferences and um, where where it's been mentioned, but mostly it, it's not. It's, it tends to be ignored. Um, so it's it's curious. I don't really understand why. And I, I, I don't think it's a conspiracy or anything. I just think it's um, uh, people are busy and it hasn't risen up to their level of priority. But I think the longer it's... It's like kind of like the wow signal, right? Like, no, people kind of ignored it for years and years and then uh it's kind of grown in decades at almost a ever greater following of people who were like hold on that observation was actually very odd what happened there and i think this is almost like a spectral wow signal that demands some kind of explanation and the the big difference is that unlike the wow signal which was kind of a transient in time uh we don't have to have a time machine 
unlike the wow signal to see it again we could just look at this star with a telescope right now today and and measure these elements so uh it's it's a little bit strange to me that that's not happened and i hope it does yeah that vexed me too because it's right there <laughs> you know that star <laughs> yeah. doesn't turn off it's right there <laughs> so, so yeah you take a look but um it would be interesting to see very high resolution spectra of that star um and see if that because it's going to get really hard to explain it you know if if you really do see you know things like einsteinium and neptunium and things like that in that star and you can actually prove that that's what that is that's what those spectral lines are uh nobel prize territory right trying to figure out what created this wouldn't you think yeah i, th I think you could be right it's it's um difficult to predict exactly what the scientific impact of something like this would be but it's certainly uh extremely strange difficult to to levy with or make sense of with any existing theories of how stars should evolve and develop um and either way i think there's something profound to be learned about this star whether it's a case of um, misidentified lines and therefore these lines are elements that we've never seen before you know, that's got to be true at a minimum level that these are lines which uh, just simply have never been seen before um, or they are indeed these radioactive elements and that demands an, a very exotic explanation which will surely push physics so I actually mentioned one of my colleagues Brian Metzger in the department uh, he's a good friend of mine he lives in the same building as me and uh, I've spoke to him and a couple of other colleagues and I've said like what do you think about this star? And they've just never heard of it. And um, I'm, I'm like, yeah, but you guys love the weird stuff. He's like kind of made a career of, he predicted the killer Nova, for instance. Um, and so he's always loved, and he worked on Boyajin star and predicted that that could have been a moon that was, uh, that was broken apart and could explain the dust cloud. So the kind of people that would be really good at coming up with ideas for what made, made this star look the way it does um have largely not even heard of this star so there's uh it's just a, a, a for some reason it's got buried and that's why we're fighting the good fight here me and you john to try and change that absolutely david and i will bring up <laughs> i will i will i will reiterate tabby star kic 8462852 yes that that star's phone number is burned into my brain permanently so what do you think about that now? Um, I am favoring a collisional model that we don't quite understand that, you know, like I said, a, a, a moon that's destroyed or something, you know, something is colliding with something. Because the last observations I saw, which were done by a, uh, a retired astronomer, Bruce Gary, the dips are less now, you know. In other words, it looks like we caught this, you know, Kepler caught this huge collision and it's just, you know, spreading out and homogenizing and the dips are much less now. Do you, or have you even, have you even kept up on it? And do you think that's what we're looking at as opposed to anything that's technosignature? Yeah, I haven't followed it super closely. I think the last time I got really um, engaged with the literature on this was when Boyajian um, measured the, me measured follow-up dips and proved that they were chromatic so that, some of the dips in you know measured a dip in blue light and red light and the depths were very different and in fact they were different in a dust. way which was consistent with dust exactly and so to me that was kind of like oh i'm losing interest in this now because i think the the exciting part of the whole story was to be honest the idea that it could have been like a dust sphere or something and some kind of solid structure around the star but i think once that measurement was made um it proved essentially that was very unlikely anymore and so uh, my interest kind of deteriorated a little bit after that point, but I, the other thing I thought was really interesting about it was the continuous dimming. So I think it's been proven that um, there was obviously a lot of back and forth between the uh, authors on this. I think it was um, Michael Hipka, and um, I'm blanking on the the name. It was a Harvard astronomer who was looking at the plates, uh, the photographic plates that they had at Harvard Observatory over the last hundred years, and they'd shown that the star had been dimming over i think of the last century it's just slowly dimming over time and there was a lot of controversy about that people weren't sure if that was real or not maybe it was something with the plates that was strange or um, the data analysis 
But then Kepler observed the same thing, and it was proven in the Kepler data that even over a four-year time span, you see a dimming which is consistent with the broader century-long time span. So uh, that, to me, remains very curious because um, if it's happening on a time scale of a century, then um, just thinking of like Bruce Gary's recent events that you mentioned, that becomes a little bit more difficult to reconcile. Like if if when Kepler looked, it was a special time. Maybe that makes sense, but then that doesn't make sense with the fact for the previous hundred years already, it was slowly decaying in brightness already. So that's um, that's a little bit difficult for me to reconcile. And uh, I think the the ideas of something disintegrating around the planet have seemed reasonable to me. But the problem is uh, they're kind of difficult to prove with the existing data. So it's a little bit. It's a little bit like Omumu at this point that you can come up with like five or six different models which seem okay. Um, none of them are easy to that to prove, and none of them are completely perfect at describing all the observations. And um, it, I've sort of have felt like it was a a, a topic that we just weren't going to resolve very soon. But um, I think you mentioned before we started talking that JWST has been pointing at it, right? Yeah, it has. And that's of particular interest because if you remember, Boyajin did uh, observations in infrared and didn't detect anything. Um, so whatever it is, it's cold, you know, cold dust, you know. And and as I recall, the very first paper on this by uh, Dr. Boyajin suggested perhaps cold comets, you know, um, mm. and that sort of thing. But that doesn't work. So whatever it is, it's cold. But that's the clarification of uh, James Webb, because if it sees infrared, then, uh, well, here, there it is. It's, it's some kind of, you know, confirmation that it's dust. But if it doesn't, this is going to get weird again, <laughs> you know, yeah. and we're going to we're going to be back to what is this going on? And you'd almost have to wonder what would happen if you had a collision. And the <laughs> statistically, to actually see this is, is insane, but if you had a collision in deep space in front of the star somewhere, <laughs> you yeah, know, between yeah. two rogue planets or a rogue planet and its moon, you know, um, but it's, it's, I, I think, I think it needs to go back on the uh, radar as far as scientific study goes though, because whatever it is, it's, it's unusual. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, it, I probably have a much more informed opinion about it uh, in two weeks because um, I mentioned to you before we started talking that we one of my classes this semester at Columbia is on controversies in astronomy, and it's a graduate class. So my graduate students and I, we sat together and we're just working through different uh, things which have been highly controversial in the field. And one of them that we're going to talk about in two weeks' time will indeed be Boyajin Star. And we're going to look at the, the whole literature trail and try and um, you know, students will present it, dissect it, give their opinion. And I always love hearing what graduate students think because they're kind of neutral actors. You know, they kind of come in with like a lot of, um, they have all the technical knowledge, right? They've, they've finished their undergraduate studies. They've got all the math behind them. They understand everything that's going on in the papers. Um, but they don't really have a, an opinion about the, the authors because sometimes people come up with an opinion about the authors, right? And that kind of, you know, affects the way they read the paper. And so I really love the clear eyes and open-mindedness of graduate students. So we're going to look at um, this star uh, together uh, in two weeks. And we've been looking at, we did today we did Venusian phosphine. Um, we've already done Oumuamua. Uh, we'll probably do the spherules. We're going to do the UAP report at the end of semester from NASA. So it's been fun. We're like, we're hitting all of these like big controversial things i think all of your listeners on 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 the on the event horizon would absolutely love it because it's the sort of stuff that you've been chewing on over there on the podcast for a while david you just handed me a whole bunch of material, uh, <laughs> interview material. <laughs> so let's take these real quick what did you think of the uap report the historic report that um i've mainly compiled under under dr uh, sean kirk Kirkpatrick, did you find that satisfying or did you find it problematic? I've, you know, I've been very skeptical about the whole UAP thing right from the outset, to be honest with you. And I think when I first saw the videos, the, the Pentagon US Navy videos, um, 
actually that wasn't true I, my immediate reaction was wow like what the hell like this is this is pretty strange i remember i grabbed my wife and was like look at this like what what like this is so strange look at this and um i, I was i was kind of uh, really fascinated by it for a few days and then um the more i started to read um from you know skeptics who were coming up with different models as to how these could be explained you know dissecting the figures and the numbers on the screen and coming up with alternative hypotheses you know my kind of skeptical brain started to kick in and realize that we had in almost all instances alternative explanations and so i think um my kind of view on the uaps is that it's kind of a product of just having so many hours of flight time i did the i did the calculation on my previous videos but i think there's a order of something like a million hours of uh, military pilot time that's flown every year and so it, that's cumulatively just a huge amount of time that we have people in the air um, doing, you know, wild stuff with their aircraft and doing maneuvers and things and observing uh, the the sky and, and sky phenomena. And so it's maybe not that surprising that you would get very rare events which defy explanation or simple explanation or could also be just erroneously miscategorized with just so many observations. It's kind of like playing... Um, you know, monkeys on a typewriter. Like if you do something enough, something they will occasionally write kind of a masterpiece just by kind of coincidence and chance. And so when you, I think when you look through the numbers of just how many hours are being flown, um, and the you you for these events to be real and to be convincing, you demand that the human error rate is less than I think one in every uh, ten thousand hours flown. So you could fly for ten thousand hours and never misidentify anything. And I think that's just um, unrealistic. As, as well-trained as the pilots are and these observers are, and I appreciate they're extremely professional and have gone through um, the most sophisticated and advanced training on Earth to do what they do. So I have nothing but respect for that. But they're not um, omniscient. They're not omnipotent. They're not faultless beings. They're, they, they're humans. And every human will sometimes by ne by necessity of being human make a mistake and i think if you assume even a very very low false positive rate an error rate for these humans it's totally consistent with the number of events which end up being reported and of course the vast majority of those in subsequent scrutiny which the nasa uap report goes through i think was something like 97 percent. i think was the number of them they could find um alternative or rational explanations for so I think I'm kind of satisfied that this is just um, a product of a huge number of observations will inevitably sometimes catch strange things, um, which actually is still quite interesting. There's probably sky phenomena which are being observed, which um, maybe we don't have good atmospheric physics to describe or understand just yet. But to reach for aliens, again, is kind of God of the gaps a little bit for me. It's like saying, well, I can't explain this, therefore aliens. And I'm always just a little bit allergic to that as a uh, as a as a chain of logic because we use that same chain of logic erroneously for thousands of years to explain why the sun rises and why the rainfall and you know all these things that in antiquity we said that's God. Um, whenever we couldn't explain anything, we just God did that. And so, to me, we're seeing stuff we don't understand. And if you invoke uh, aliens as the explanation. It's really not that different from from what we did uh, and we know was fallacious for thousands of years. So I think there's, in some cases there's interesting atmospheric phenomena going on, but I think a large part of it is just a huge number of observations and to some degree even very small human error will produce um, of order of thousands of observations per year given the uh, inordinate number of hours that they fly. The God of Spinoza did it. That's how I, I like to uh, <laughs> say it, that the, the sum of the laws of the universe are, are, you know, do what they do. And I believe yeah. Einstein actually said that and so did Carl Sagan. But the, it's important, though, when you're you're dealing with UAP to keep an open mind, number one. But number two, that idea of rare atmospheric phenomena goes all the way back to Donald Menzel. You know, very, very early uh, Harvard mm -hmm. scientist that looked into it and actually saw a UFO, but suspected that uh, there's things about the atmosphere that we don't entirely understand. 
Um, I think that that's fruitful, but you have to be open to the other options. You know, I mean, we don't know what it is. Unidentified is the key word there, right? So the key, I guess, moving forward is to try to identify it. So do you think that efforts like the Galileo Project, and uh, actually there's several, to try to um, look into this and collect data that we can actually, you know, actionable, scientifically actionable data above and beyond accounts, do you think that's worthwhile? Honestly, I don't know. I really don't know. And I, I, I think it's hard to to guess at this point. The reason why I say that is um, I've been thinking really hard about this. I actually wrote a paper about it recently on um, it, on the, I think we called it deconstructing alien hunting. Me and Jason Wright wrote a paper together about this. And we tried to come up with a framework for looking for aliens just generally. Like it could be anything. It could be a search for UFOs. It could be a search for Pishbilsky stars. It could be a search for um, radio signatures, or it could be a search for, say, fossils on Mars. Whatever it is, like whatever uh, you you want, it could fit into this framework. And we came up, you know, I realized there was three fundamental problems with the alien hypothesis that distinguish it from pretty much any other hypothesis in science. The first one is that aliens can explain anything. So no matter what observation i give you a ufo um a strange rock on mars uh, a strange shadow on mars or whatever it is you can always say oh an alien did that even even the very um existence of say why is uh, my car white why is it painted white and you could say oh that's because an alien did that there's basically nothing that you can't use aliens as an explanation to as however contrived it might sound you could always use it so that's kind of unusual there's not many, I can't think of anything else in, um, in science where a mechanism is proposed that can explain absolutely anything you want. That's pretty unusual. The other thing that's odd about aliens is that they can evade every experiment conceivable if they want to. So again, like you could say, um, look, we haven't uh, detected uh, any life on Mars. Therefore, Mars has no life. And you'd be right in being skeptical about that and saying, well, hold on, maybe life is just hiding under that rock over there, or maybe life is underneath the surface a few meters down and we've not dug down yet. And no matter what we do, we can never disprove life on Mars. We'll never be able to fully disprove life on Mars. And we can never disprove life on an exoplanet or anywhere else. And again, that's that's kind of odd that you that and and similarly you could say you know i saw a ufo on monday and tuesday so i come to see you with you on wednesday and it doesn't happen and you could say well the the alien was just shy today he didn't want to come today and i can't disprove your hypothesis but it it becomes very difficult for me to make uh scientific progress with something that's so malleable like that and so the third and final thing you might do is the one we've already kind of alluded to is this Sherlock Holmes attitude that I think Avi Loeb's been a proponent of, which is to say, okay, don't worry about alien intent or alien behavior. Just look for that which nature can't explain. Like just go after the impossible, basically. And if you see something impossible, then you know that it must be aliens because all of the hypotheses have been ruled out. But the, the immediate problem with that is that you're assuming um, implicitly tacitly that your knowledge of nature is complete in designing such an experiment that my understanding of atmospheric physics is so complete that if i see something going faster than the speed of sound it has to be aliens there's absolutely no alternative and i just i'm not convinced that our understanding of pretty much any scientific phenomena is is approaching complete um even even like things like the motions of the planets are still still produced like the pioneer anomaly or objects in, you know moving through the universe still often defy our understanding of like celestial mechanics let alone uh, the nuanced physics of atmospheric physics which is far more complicated so you're kind of stuck and this has been I, I do worry a lot about can is it even possible to scientifically look for aliens given that it has all of these very uh peculiar features from a scientific perspective and that's been that's been deep in my mind recently and i think it's as relevant to uaps as any other search whether it be bias signatures tennis signatures whatever you want the sad thing david is that you know ambiguity that's what it is and it's yeah. it's actually very difficult to determine if an alien civilization is present or not unless they make themselves very unambiguous but the fact is 
we are ambiguous. <laughs> so yeah. you know, the first setting message we get is either going to be, so what do you guys think is happening at Tabby Star or Shabilsky Star? Or it will be, why are you guys so ambiguous? We barely even saw you. <laughs> you know, you only sent out <laughs> that one Arecibo <laughs> signal. Yeah. We happened to get it, but you didn't repeat it. It's our wow signal. Come on. So it, it's the ambigu- ambiguity of it all. And maybe over, and it could take centuries, maybe we might be able to establish that. But I, I, I recently, you know, have been re-examining just the the very basic biological ideas about you know what could constrict the the fermi paradox and i i I really think that intelligence is just rare you know um microbial life sure but you know and even complex life plants whatever sure but intelligence just seems incredibly rare do you agree with that i kind of am coming around to that view um i've always tried to be as you probably know very forcibly agnostic on this um, discussion of both life in the universe and intelligent life in the universe for both of them that we should um, forcibly be open-minded to both possibilities because when we're set either way whether it's that we think we're alone in the universe or that every planet is teeming with life whatever your position is if you if you make it too firm in your mind uh, then you kind of see what you want to see, and that's called confirmation bias, and that's that's a big problem in science, and it happens in many different fields. So, I think it's always been uh, a, an attitude I've tried to maintain that it's healthy as a scientist to be forcibly agnostic, open-minded to both possibilities. Having said that, um, I am writing a paper right now with my colleague uh, in Sydney, Grant Lewis. Um, who wrote a wonderful book about fine tuning in the universe and all the you know the the way the speed of light is just the right speed and oh, yes. the electron mass is just the right mass and all these different values. Great and Lewis, I kind of friend. okay, good. And I suggested to him that I think SETI optimists have a fine tuning problem, and um, we're working on the paper together right now. It's actually almost complete. But I kind of feel the same way that I think we can basically exclude the hypothesis that the galaxy has a filling fraction close to one. That, let's say, every single exoplanet has a civilization on it which is as advanced as ours or more advanced. That just seems totally inconsistent with our observations of the universe unless there's some extreme grand conspiracy going on. So I think if you chalk that off, it's also inconsistent with Earth's history. Right, Earth's history did not have a technological species on it for certainly the first three billion years because everything was single-celled during that time. So we're pretty confident that Earth-based life was not <laughs> was not uh, building cities for the first three billion years. Um, so it kind of comes, you know, it raises some questions about if there's no, if the universe is not filled with life, um, then there's this idea called the, the Haldane Pry, which I've always been a big fan of. And Haldane was a chemist. And he said, look, imagine this. Imagine that you have a set of beakers laid out in a laboratory, in a chemistry laboratory, and they're filled with water. And the temperature in the room is you know, almost the same, but it's maybe slightly warmer on one side of the room than the other. Maybe the pressure in the air is slightly different on one side of the room than the other, but it's more or less the same water. And now I give you chemical X, a, a weird chemical you've never seen before. And I'm going to ask you a question. How often do you expect chemical X will dissolve amongst these beakers of water? And he argued that you would reasonably expect that it will dissolve essentially every time in that beaker of water or hardly ever. But it would be pretty weird if it dissolved 50% of the time because it's almost the same beaker of water and it's the same chemical every time. And yes, there are slight differences, but in order to dissolve 50% of the time, the conditions in the room would have to be almost finely tuned such that it was right on the threshold as to whether the chemical would dissolve or not, which was just improbable. And so he argued that it's going to be one way or the other. And I kind of feel the same way about life in the universe. I think either if you give you know a bunch of Earth-like planets, which there are billions and billions surely in the universe, um, either they will always go on to form life and eventually civilizations, or it's an extremely rare phenomenon. And, you know, given the same initial conditions, you'd expect basically the same outcomes over and over again. It's just kind of basic logic. And so if we can rule out 
the latter, that there is an overwhelming number of civilizations, then that immediately concludes that therefore there must be very, very few of them. That you're in the case where chemical X basically very rarely dissolves in the beakers. And that makes sense because we necessarily would have to be the one beaker that did dissolve because we are us, we are alive and we're, you know, by the weak anthropic principle, we're seeing ourselves. So uh, I tend, I've been thinking more towards that angle and only about intelligent life. You can't, I don't think you can extend this argument to simple life because it is actually perfectly possible that every single planet in the universe is teeming with microbial life, uh, or at least every single habitable zone planet, let's say, is teeming with microbial life. I could probably believe that, but I think we have, I think I'd be, I think I would not be comfortable with the argument that every single habitable zone planet in the universe has an intelligent civilization on it, which is as sophisticated as our own, and yet somehow has evaded all observations thus far. Radio SETI, laser SETI, Dyson sphere searches, um, you know, searches for excess emission, all this kind of stuff, and yet somehow it's evaded everything. So to me, that does push me towards the, the more pessimistic view. I waffle, David. I go pessimistic and optimistic back and forth, and I've done it for almost 40 years <laughs> <laughs> regarding alien life. All right, we are out of time. David, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I look forward to uh, doing it again sometime soon. And everybody should check out David Kipping's Cool Worlds channel. It's one of the best science channels on YouTube. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.